Hello everybody, good afternoon or good morning depending on which state um, or where in the world you are today. My name is Sophie Harrington, I'm the Chief Operating Officer for No Fasd Australia. Today we're bringing you the first in a series of three webinars on child and adolescent to parent violence and abuse. Um, and we will be bringing Associate Professor Anita Gibbs from the University of Otago to you. I'm just going to share my screen with you so you can see the presentation um, that we're obviously working from today. So I would first of all like to acknowledge um, uh, the traditional custodians of the land that we meet on today. So NOFASD Australia acknowledges and pays respects to the past, present and future traditional custodians and elders of this nation and the continuation of cultural, spiritual and educational practices of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. So Associate Professor Anita Gibbs um, joins us um, by a recorded session today. Um, she's a professor at the University of Otago. Now Anita's a registered social worker um, and a university lecture lecturer um, and has been so for the last 20 years across a range of different areas. Um, her research interests include fetal alcohol spectrum disorder and complex disabilities and really identifying best practice and evidence in helping families and professionals. What I will say today is that there's some pretty courageous conversations that are coming through from Anita with some personal sharing and I just want to make sure this is a safe environment for everybody. Um, it may trigger people in terms of some of the conversations that are being discussed and some of the images that are being shared. And I just want everyone to know that there is support out there and self-care is incredibly important. Um, no FASD Australia have our helpline which operates seven days per week. You should be able to see the number on your screen right now and that's 1800 860 613. I will also be sharing this number again at the end of the webinar and also um, we'll share some other helpline numbers that you may be able to utilise too. Um, if you could please send through any questions using the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen throughout the webinar. The questions will be recorded anonymously um, in preparation for answering live with Anita in session three, which is Tuesday the 4th of August. So all of the questions that come through, they will be written down um, and they will be shared with Anita, but your names will not be shared. So over to you, Anita. Three. Well, hello everyone. Uh, tēnā koutou katoa, ko Dartmoor, te moanga, ko X, te awa, ko Xmas, te moana, ko Anglo-Saxon, te iwi, ko Devonian, te hapu, ko Exeter Cathedral, te morai, ko Anita Gibbs, tōku ingoa, no ingarangi aho, engari ke otapoti taku kaina, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tato katoa. I've greeted you in a uh, Māori. Hello, I'm Anita, uh, originally from England, obviously living in New Zealand. But I'd also like to acknowledge and pay respect to the past, present and future traditional custodians and elders of Australia and the continuation of cultural, spiritual and educational practices of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. Warm greetings to you all. You've tuned in to um, this webinar on child and adolescent to parent violence and abuse. Thank you for tuning in. So there's going to be three webinars, as you well know. Um, and over the next two webinars in particular, my plan is to unpack um, what, what is adolescent or child to parent violence and abuse. Um, how extensive is it? What causes it? Um, is it the same as other types of family violence or harm? And what is the impact on different family members? And you're obviously tuning in to, to learn uh, about this particular topic, possibly from your own experience. Um, in part two, we'll be looking at responses from professionals as well as strategies and interventions that might help. Um, and we'll be trying to encourage collaborative participation um, through you um, ans asking questions as we go through these uh, two webinars before we have our live question and answer webinar um, in a month or so time on the 4th of August. So. In terms of um, initially just um, introducing myself, well, um, basically, um, I'm a, a social work uh, 
registered social work academic here at Otago. I've been teaching in this uh, university for 20 years, but I've been practicing as a social worker, continued to do so. Um, I've also adopted um, ch whoops, uh, children from Russia, um, and I also have a birth daughter. So what I would say is that I'm sharing from my own experience as well as my academic qualifications and background, and I'm um, reflecting um, on the literature, the practice literature, the research literature, and the lived experience literature throughout this webinar. And I hope really to help others gain insights about this kind of taboo topic. And I hope to help caregivers uh, know that they're not alone because a number of us have been through it. So I would um, basically say, you know, this might stir up a few things for you. Uh, you might get a little bit um, upset, uh, but there'll be people um, you can turn to and uh, get support from if there are things that um, concern you as you hear um, some of the stories or just some of the issues that are going on for families and caregivers uh, in terms of parenting children who um, sometimes uh, unfortunately uh, are violent or abusive uh, but these webinars are attempting to be um, tell you really that caregivers you're not alone um, and there are many of us um, who understand um, we want to do something and we want to make, make things more positive so I will sometimes maybe share from my own life as well so we need to be respectful to each other as we um, go through this series of um, sessions together so as we go through start um, storing up questions uh, and answers um, will we'll, um, be shared um, in a, a few weeks time so what are we what are we talking about here this is a chance for you to immediately ponder uh, perhaps your own experience this is um, this is uh, one of my broken uh, walls um, recently repaired by my lovely husband whilst we were locked down and he would have never got around to it had we been not um, not locked down so that was one of the benefits of lockdown uh, but what are we talking about here uh, for different people it might feel like it's going to be different things so I'm hoping um, to show you a few clips as well as what it might be like for um, for those to experience um, adolescent parent, parent violence and abuse. We're going to start with a clip from the BBC. Um, there'll be a few clicks while I get it organised. Um, but it's a really um, short clip, poignant clip from um, this little boy, this gorgeous boy, Jamie, who's now seven, um, who really from the age of about three, um, was having massive meltdowns and struggles. So we're just going to um, hear what it's like for his mum in terms of experiencing um, really quite substantial <laughs> damage um, and, and violence. This is a government that is actually ensuring that mental health is given the attention that it needs. There are times like this when Jamie is like any other child his age. But he's not your typical seven-year-old. He has a rare form of autism known as PDA or pathological demand avoidance, meaning he goes to great lengths to avoid situations that cause him to be anxious. Knives, anything that he can get his hands on has, uh, you know, he's come at me with, because he's, he's pulled curtain poles, the like curtains off the uh, rails, and he'll come at me with those, um, spat at me. Ow, Jamie, stop doing that to me, please, it really hurts. This home video recorded by Jamie's mom shows what happens when anxiety can quickly turn into violence. It's early in the morning and Jamie doesn't want to go to school. He's anxious and is finding the situation stressful. Shocking to watch, but this gives you a glimpse of why his mom is desperate for help. Jamie! Part of me can't believe that that's my child in some ways because we have really good times and when I see that I don't know it's, it's hard to explain it's it's um it's quite traumatic really he could drop a bit of paper on the floor and I could say you know Jane please can you pick that up rather than picking it up because that's a demand you could have half an hour 
plus meltdown because I've asked him in a direct way to pick that up. He went upstairs to the toilet and then came out of the, I managed to get him out of the toilet because he locked himself in there. And he's just chucked everything. This is just manic. And I can't, I'm, and I'm doing this from a broken iPad that he's broke smashed. I just can't do this anymore. Jamie, who also has ADHD, was just three years old when he started becoming violent. But a long wait for his diagnosis forced Kate, who is now a single mom, to spend nearly £10,000 to get a private consultation. GPs are usually the first point of contact when it comes to recognising autism. Bear with while I get back to the PowerPoint. You can see from um, what we've experienced there on that vid uh, how the impact in that family's life has been uh, for what we may call um, violence and abuse um, and controlling behaviour at the same time here we are is with a lad with a special need and we know that for fetal alcohol spectrum disorder in particular that that is a special need. Um, so where do we draw the line between um, intentional um, or um, behaviour or situations and anxiety going on for a child that is um, completely as a consequence of the special education need that they may have or the disability that they may have. We'll talk about that as we go through. So what is it that you see um, in a sense, if you're a caregiver or if you're a support worker, um, if you're a relative or if you're distant, what is it that you see uh, and would you experience perhaps? Um, and is it, um, how does it impact you? So as far as the literature is concerned, we have um, a whole range of things that will impact people. And sometimes it is just the daily, um, it would seem verbal abuse and insults and belittling and demeaning and um, criticizing for some people that can be overwhelming especially if it's well multiple times a day it's damage perhaps uh, I mean Jamie um, certainly did uh, quite a lot of damage uh, but it can be other things like perhaps stealing um, and then how do you know um, you know what that's about whether that is about controlling and it may be depending on frequency or intent or if they just target a particular person um, it can be constant demanding um, the need to control and keep things um, from being overwhelming for the child and it can be um, telling all sorts of untruths uh, to professionals about you um, in a way that undermines and, and sometimes leads to investigation actually by child protection services of the parent because it looks like the child is um, telling a, a social worker or others about abuse. It can be threats, all sorts of threats, um, threats to harm, threats to self-harm or to use self-harm in order to get their own way. Um, all of these things, kicking, hitting, spitting, and th these might be some things you will have experienced and um, again that can be exhausting and distressing and um, really challenge your mental well-being um, screaming shouting um, and also siblings can be sort of dragged into it I mean our, our two boys used to fight each other a lot um, and there was always a lot of screaming and shouting and we try and de-escalate and that didn't always work so sometimes we ended up screaming and shouting and none of us are perfect um, we've all been um, if we're parents and caregivers uh, of children with FASD uh, we know what it's like to be imperfect um, and sometimes it can be online abuse that, but keep, well, in fact, increasingly so, that can be causing harm um, back to the, the parents and so forth. And it can be um, ex at extreme levels, extreme violence using weapons and so forth. So, um, and if you want to, um, you know, add other things in, do so when we have our live Q and A. So here is um, Lee. Lee is contributing to um, our sessions. Lee is a social worker. Um, in Hawke's Bay and she has kindly contributed um, some clips talking about what it's like to uh, parent her daughter with child to parent adolescence and abuse. So we're going to hear from her from time to time uh, and we'll start with this first one.
What kinds of behaviours does your daughter do or has done which you experience as abusive and or violent? Um, our daughter, um, she's always been quite aggressive ever since she was a baby. She came to us at seven months old and she would um, often dysregulate and get very angry and go rigid. And as she got older, um, she became more aggressive. And by the time she was about seven, um, it, it was pretty bad. She would, um, she would hit us, kick us, spit at us, slap, chase us around with knives. She smashed a window in temper, a really big window, damage your walls, throw things. Um, from the age of about seven, um, she was calling us cunts. And just all the time, it's like every day is a battle. Like you'd say, time to have a shower. Fuck off, cunt. Um, cooking dinner and she'd come to the cupboard and want to eat and you say, hey, I'm just dishing up dinner in five minutes. Can we just wait? Fuck off, bitch. Do you want a smack in the face? And that's how she's talked to us. So she's 14 now, but it's been a continual battle with her behaviour. And I really feel like we're living in a war zone. And it's just very, very been very difficult and, and hard, really, and, and sad. Very sad. So obviously, thank you, Lee, for sharing some of your story. Lee's um, gave it very specific examples of the relentless um, verbal and at times uh, physical and certainly threats going on and how the fact that it's um, tiring and um, distressing for all family members. So moving on to define this issue, this is where we have many definitions and I'm going to give you quite a few so that you basically um, have a sense of the range of the way that this is being viewed because obviously in a conversation with those you may be asking for help um, you may get lost in translation because somebody may define it one way um, yet you may define it another way so I'm just going to basically ensure that you have a range of definitions through these presentations one of the most frequently quoted one is um, by Cottrell um, back in 2001 that talks about an act of a child that is intended to cause physical, psychological or financial damage to gain power and control over a parent. Um, as you see these definitions, you'll um, in your mind probably be thinking about, well, how intentional is my child given that we're talking about neurodisability here? Um, and I think it's really important to um, hold that in mind and how much control um, are they in control of the whole situation. Helen Bonnick, who's written a great resource, which I'll mention later, she talks about um, children and young people using child parent violence and abuse to include a wide range of abuses, abusive behaviours, including acts of violence and controlling tactics. Um, generally, the parent is a target or the caregiver of abusive behaviour by the child under the age of 18 of age. It's the child who's using violence to disempower the parent. There's an element of disempowerment going on. And Holt, Amanda Holt, who's uh, done a lot of research in uh, the UK, she talks about it involving a pattern of behaviour instigated by a child of or young person, which involves verbal, financial, physical, and or emotional means to practice power and exert control over a parent. She goes on to say, the power that is practiced is to some in extent intentional, um, some extent, and I think that's important to uh, recognize that, and that the control that is exerted over a parent is achieved through fear, so that often families experiencing child to parent or adolescent parent violence and abuse are fearful. They are genuinely afraid of their child um, over time that the child will harm them or continue to emotionally and psychologically abuse them to the point where they are not going to be able to function. Um, so it's important to understand it can be obviously serious and profound. It's not just um, one-off events at all. Uh, Patterson, the news, um, Australian authors, I think, and colleagues um, talk about behaviour 
that is considered to be violent if others in the family feel threatened, intimidated, or controlled by it, and if they believe that they must adjust their own be behavior to accommodate threats or anticipation of violence. And families do talk about um, hiding in rooms, um, just pulling out of the, the TV or the tech room in order to have a sense of uh, peace and um, well-being um, and basically trying to not um, push um, their child into any activities that they know will cause the child to uh, really melt down and, and start to um, harm them in any way. Um, child to bear violence is another um, definition by Pereira cited in um, an article by Curtis um, referring to the repeated um, re repeated is the word emphasized here, I think, physical, psychological, economic violence perpetrated by a child and directed towards a parent or a person who by statute has custody, guardianship or access rights to that child. So that's obviously wider family and um, guardians and grandparents. And um, yeah, there was some recent um, research um, a couple of years back um, where um, grandparents in half the case were um, unfortunately um, on the receiving end of some of those behaviours and um, uh, you know emotional abuses that we've already alluded to as being um, quite substantial in this particular area of family violence, although we also uh, could allude to it being a, a unique type of violence and abuse in its own right. Yvonne Newbard, who I truly admire, absolutely wonderful lady, who um, has a, um, well, a, a range of supports in the UK, um, she talks about violence and challenging behavior and, and Judy Selwyn recently did a, a webinar and she sort of said, well, yes, maybe we shouldn't always call it challenging behavior because that might water down some of the violence and abuse. But, but VCB um, with special education, um, children with special educational needs and disabilities is a fabulous resource in the UK that I've um, found really helpful myself. Um, her emphasis, um, which is, again, it's all important, is, is not, it's not that deliberate intent. Um, yes, it looks like extremely bad behavior and it certainly comes out obviously in, in violence and abuse in the behavioral um, form, but it stems from a place of extreme anxiety and we need to explore and unpack that anxiety. This anxiety can be triggered by a number of issues. Now, those of you who are parents or caregivers with um, children who have neurodisabilities, fetal alcohol in particular, you know that uh, extreme anxiety um, can lead to all sorts of chaos and damage um, and that certain things will trigger an anxiety in your child um, and it may be different for different children. So it could be the sensory processing difficulties, could be things going on at school, could be communication difficulties that they're not able to express themselves or they you know, got a bit confused about what somebody else is saying. Um, transition difficulties, just moving from place to place um, without warning. Sometimes that can be way too much for a child who's really struggling with the world that they're living in and feeling overwhelmed by it. So her emphasis is that all behaviour is a form of communication and we need to unpack what that communication is trying to say. Well, what, you know, what is the purpose of that behaviour? They're trying to tell us something um, and maybe their needs are not being fully met. So we need to work out what they're trying to tell us um, so that we can understand them better and obviously we can reach out to them better. And that might be the key for some people just starting to work out how to turn that violent behaviour around or that abusive behaviour around. It's not always easy to work out. She emphasises it's not always easy to work out what is behind those behaviours. Um, so obviously um, you might need some help in that process. So this is a relatively new area, I guess, in terms of talking about um, this type of violence and control. And we, there's many versions. Uh, that's why I've highlighted this line here, really. Um, there's a large range of terms that are being used, challenging behavior, child to parent violence and abuse, adolescent to parent violence and aggression, parent abuse, youth violence in the home, battered parents is a term that has been used historically, uh, violent and challenging behavior, victims, perpetrators is, you know, um, inevitably people are trying to find a language and actually we can, I guess, as those with lived experience, try and find an appropriate language together that's not too disempowering of our children or demeaning of ourselves. And that would be good to chat about in our live Q&A. 
there's definitely going to be issues around control, safety, who is feeling safe or unsafe. And in fact, often in a family, everyone's feeling unsafe, even the child who is, um, it appears to be dishing out um, the violence and abuse, they often feel unsafe. Communication is a critical issue. So we need to keep those things in, in mind as we try to unpack this um, adolescent parent violence and abuse. How much? Well, again, we need some research projects here. We're not actually sure. We um, have seen um, in different countries attempts at uh, measurement, but really not very far along the way to actually unpack what's going on. There was a report last year from the BBC that talked about cases of adolescent um, to parent violence and abuse incidents being recorded by about 19 out of 32 police um, authorities in the UK and that it had doubled in terms of incidents recorded in the last three to four years. Um, but that's all relative because people have only just been acknowledging it and recording it. So we don't have as much as we would like, but, but there have been surveys and so forth. So basically, these are some of the stats. Um, up to 3 to 27% of families are affected. Different surveys report different amount. Um, in single parent families, it's been recorded up to almost one third of um, those in single parent families. The problem is it's kind of either underestimated or hidden. So we, 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 we need more data. There's been great research in Australia, in um, Victoria, particularly through the um, Royal Commission um, of fam into family violence. So we, in Victoria, for example, we had the police saying one in 10 police call outs um, for family violence were adolescent to parent violence in 2016. There are some groups that appear to be at risk. Um, again, we need more research, but those who are using substances or those who have a background of offending or absconding, more vulnerable perhaps um, children, um, but we don't really obviously know um, for sure if it's, um, you know, it, it goes with the territory, but these children could be in circumstances where they're um, less able to manage their emotions um, or they're in a constant state of fear and anxiety. Particularly adoptive and fostering uh, situations. Um, we've got Selwyn and Meekings who've done some great research um, and we're looking at 29 to 58% of these families will report child to parent, adolescent violence and, and abuse. And it's the main reason why adoptive and long-term placements break down. And some of you, that may be your reality or that may have been your experience or you know about that, um, that, you know, parents just couldn't go the long haul or they, or they went for year after year, but they could not get any help and support and they were just left and abandoned and the children um, unfortunately just carried on being violent and abusive and they just, the family broke down, unfortunately. So that's a big issue for adoptive and fostering, uh, fostering families or kin. The um, child to parent violence and abuse um, is not obviously linked to socioeconomic or ethnicity factors. There's emerging research suggesting, this is from Coogan, Declan Coogan in um, Ireland, I think, suggesting that there's evidence to support considerable levels of assault within well-educated well and middle-class families. So that's a kind of interesting finding, but um, a great article by O'Hara et al, um, which I put forward in the PowerPoints, a couple of PowerPoints time, those in poverty, um, those in challenged socioeconomic circumstances, those living in disorganized community this side of the state, um, where violence is common in those community, there is evidence of um, increased um, adolescent to parent violence and abuse. And I'd also highlight um, in Australia, Lauren Moulds, um, again, I've got one reference for you, but she's finished a PhD in this area, but, through Deakin University in 2019. Currently, she works at the University of Adelaide. She has done um, a lot of research in this area in Australia um, and can you know, give information. Here's one article that she published, 2019 it was published, um, looking at what was uh, happening with prevalence and characteristics using Australian police data with colleagues. Um, as I mentioned before, there was a survey, I think it was BAPS Care 2017, where um, there was an online survey of 101 kinship carers. And, and in that survey, 46% of children being cared for had exhibited violence and aggressive behavior towards other family members. And most of this violence and aggression was directed towards their carer in about 90% of cases. 
um, and for the carers. Um, often, as I say, they were um, uh, kind of grandparents and so forth or kin carers. This violence towards them was experienced daily or weekly. And often, if you do meet with your peers, um, it is uh, daily that we're talking to other parents. I've spent a lot of time talking to parents. I mean, Lee's one of uh, the people I would talk with. Unfortunately, we're talking daily. Um, the frequency is the aspect that often exhausts because quite often, um, you can manage being called every name under the sun for a few hours or a day, um, maybe two days. But if it's every single day of your life without um, any break whatsoever, that is um, potentially overwhelming. So by whom? Well, so, um, the research is telling us that those who've witnessed previous violence, up to half of those people, um, if you like, unfortunately, who've been in situations, this could be obviously where they've witnessed um, int intimate partner violence happening. Um, they have that as their background in terms of adolescent to child to parent violence. So that's um, obviously a, an issue worthy of an investigation. Um, there are situations where the mother um, herself would have had previous violence in child and where they're currently being abused that's a factor adolescent males towards mothers yes there's definitely some gender aspects um, going on um, but this can also be uh, I mean I know parents where females are um, unfortunately causing their mums and dads both absolute distress and grief so it's not entirely uh, down to um, you know the emphasis on boys against mothers but it's definitely a factor the peak ages are uh, between 13 and 17 in terms of um, what's um, obviously being reported and what parents are saying is difficult to manage, I guess. And, um, you know, for, for girls, they may grow out of it a wee bit. Uh, boys will go on for a bit longer, but we, you know, worry about the fact that a number of these uh, children and young people will go on to be adults who abuse. So obviously the sooner we can see um, work intervention help and support uh, as with all aspects of intervention the earlier the better with ethnicity we haven't really got enough research in the uk one study showed that african caribbean families were overrepresented, but most studies are still showing um white european offenders and victims so again that could be to do with reporting help seeking behavior um, whether or not it's, um, if you like, uh, Europeans who mostly adopt or foster um, or other processes that other ethnicities have to look after their own. Um, there will be a range of reasons why we don't really know um, if, um, you know, particular groups are particularly vulnerable. Um, certainly, there's been research showing that children with restless, impulsive, less emotional regulation, and that would fit um, quite well with what we know about our neurodisability issues for our children um, would be more likely to have oppositional behavior or more likely to have their meltdowns or um, experience extreme anxiety and sensory overload. Um, you know, their needs might not be being met in a whole range of environments, but that then um, ending up at home. And they're often masking all day long, doing really well at school, and they come home and it's a um, explosion. People tell me that all the time. So, uh, Weinblatt and Ober have done some research um, looking at things like impulsive temperaments um, and sense of entitlement that comes through sometimes as well. Um, sometimes there's parents and factors as well, but there are definitely research gaps. Uh, people talk about permissive parenting, where there's perhaps less limit setting, where it looks like children are ruling the roost, so to speak, or parents have ended up. Um, it's not worth the battle. So they end up um, saying yes to too much, really against their better judgment, perhaps, um, and feeling a sense of helplessness. People talk about getting entrenched in escalating cycles or patterns. Uh, but one thing I really want to make clear is that we should not be blaming parents here uh, because parents will be feeling, caregivers will be feeling pretty awful anyway. Um, and parents and caregivers are genuinely, the fact that you're probably watching this, you're seeking answers, you're seeking um, to understand better what's going on for you um, and you're actually, you love your children, uh, you're not responsible and you should not be blamed for any violence that occurs to you. 
uh, yes, we can all seek better ways to um, develop relationships with our children. Uh, but I know from my own experience that we, we can end up blaming ourselves. In the study by Selwyn and Meekins, um, she found um, this was in relation to adoptive, adoptive uh, families that about 70% of the violence and abuse was coming from boys to their caregivers and about 30% was um, girls. I just thought I'd mention that. So what are the reasons or factors underpinning um, child to parent violence and adolescent to parent violence and abuse? Well, not surprisingly, neurodisability triggers, of course, um, as I've hinted at, anxiety over 101 things. And it's not often the things that you would imagine. Um, quite often, I know in my own experience, my children were amazing with what I would consider big challenging things. And then the most silly little things like breaking a pencil or uh, food being in the wrong place, um, not sleeping on the right side of the bed. These things um, often could lead to an absolute uh, spiral of um, damage and chaos. So we've got to understand um, the, the anxiety. What is it um, that the child is triggered by? Uh, somewhere perhaps needs not being met because of de developmental gel delays. That could be genetic, obviously, prenatal alcohol or other um, genetic, um, uh, sorry, the impact of prenatal alcohol exposure or genetic factors. Uh, and that can be mixed with environmental factors um, that the children um, are experiencing in their first few years of life, for example, which obviously could include trauma um, as well as post-traumatic uh, stress disorder. That could be relationship and attachment disorders if, if they've lost their first caregiver or birth parents. That could be uh, mental health issues as they go through the life course, particularly in their teens. That could be substance misuse and so on. They're not coping with the demands, you know, and there's a sense of being overwhelmed and um, not able to, to cope. Uh, that could be a massive um, factor in why um, we end up with damage and violence. A sense of the need to control, particularly with those with um, pathological demand avoidance, where um, it really is um, overwhelming to be asked to do a, a, a small task sometimes for, for those with um, that particular um, part of the autism spectrum disorder. So children may interpret their world as being dangerous or unsafe, even though, I mean, it's hard to believe sometimes because families are saying, well, we're trying to provide a loving home, we're trying to provide supervision and support, and yet the child seems to be finding that unsafe and dangerous. Um, but you don't even know that is happening for your child. So it's kind of like, how do we find that out? How do we find a way to reach out to them? But for a child that doesn't feel safe, and we know that that's often the case in school, or when they have transitions or when they join social or sports club or try to, when they're rejected by their peers. We know that um, children get very stressed. Our children get very stressed. Um, and that can lead to violence, hyper alertness, sort of ready to blow at all times. Certainly, um, I find that to be the case with my, my youngest. Um, we're always expecting the volcano at, at any time. So the environment is important. The external factors are important. Other things that might be going on, Holt talks about asking patterns. So that might be the child saying, you need to give me this, give me that, give me this, give me this, give me that. Okay, all children ask their parents to give them stuff. Um, but um, some of these children uh, never give up and they're relentless. Um, and then that can lead to all sorts of um, abuse um, and um, not accepting no um, all the boundaries that the parents are trying to appropriately um, stand um, along and, and keep to. We can have repressed patterns. You could be asking your child to be doing something like stopping using their device. That is often a flashpoint. I know many of you hearing might actually be going, yes, that's definitely a flashpoint. Um, but it could be other things that you think are innocuous uh, that are not innocuous because they result in all manner of um, damage and abuse and, and violence. Some of it can be learned, of course. Um, hopefully, you know, for many of us, it's not in our family home. It may have been because of the previous exposure to violence in the, in the first family home. Um, or they might have a sibling that they're observing um, as well. So, um, or it might be an outside factor observing their peers. For some, Judy Selwyn talked a lot in a webinar uh, about, recent webinar about 
the sort of teenage onset um, violence and, you know, the, the puberty aspect, um, or for some people um, engaging in addictive behavior um, through their teens, so that they were reasonable up until a certain age, and then they exploded into this teenager who was scary and threatening. Uh, but others talk about, um, Judy talked about 20% of those kids that are basically from way to go when you first um, uh, you know, took them to a preschool situation or as a toddler, um, we're already having these massive meltdowns. It is similar to other forms of family violence, but whether it should be entirely covered by that, I don't know. Um, that is a debatable um, conversation, again, that we, we could have, because sometimes if you put it under family violence, it gets subsumed under family violence, and therefore the needs of the parents um, don't get looked at in relation to what's happening um, from the harm uh, you know that they're experiencing from their child however um, maybe resources are also um, targeted in the family violence arena and they can actually um, be um, channeled rather than creating new things to better support families where this type of abuse is occurring so Holt has done um, some work on this and talks about yes there is a gendered nature of course because there are more female victims and more male um, perpetrators, or I hate using that terminology. Um, there is the poly victimization, so it's not just say you know a bit of um, criminal damage, uh, you know, or sorry, damage to the to the property. It can be obviously verbal abuse, emotional abuse, financial abuse, uh, as well as physical abuse. So there is that commonality. There's the victim blaming. Often, yeah, you're to blame. It's your folk mum that you did this. Um, or your folk dad that you did this it's it's never um, you know the child themselves um, they're struggling to accept any responsibility the social resistance to the abuse well those of you who have spent time seeking help you'll know what that's like you'll know that um, people um, kind of don't want to talk about it relatives friends support workers professionals teachers perhaps I'm not saying that that's um, that's a little bit sort of um, carte blanche but basically um, you have experienced that there's di differentness in the sense of we're still legally responsible for our children obviously so um, you know we it's very difficult to walk away from your children if you're still legally responsible for, for them and you're made to, to definitely feel that you can't walk away from them um, that means that the children's needs are often prioritized uh, because the youth is seen as vulnerable and Therefore, sometimes um, you're expected to kind of suck it up um, because you are the parent and you are the legal guardian. Um, so there is a lot of parent blaming um, and parent guilt goes alongside that. So a lot of parents wouldn't be willing to report in the same way that many years ago, people would not report domestic or family violence because they didn't think they would be believed. Women didn't feel they would be believed. So we're still sort of working on, um, you know, policy and practice guidelines. Uh, I mean, my own experience was that refuge, in the, uh, refuge women's services in New Zealand were absolutely fantastic. I'm conscious of time because I always tend to talk more than <laughs> I ever give myself time to get everything out there. I mean, what, I'd like to say that there are many kind of different pathways um, if you like in terms of explaining what's going on and I'd love to hear from you what you think if you like is the reasons or are the reasons why we do see child to parent adolescence abuse and violence um, so understanding it could be cognitive impairments it can be social learning it can be impacts from family members and peers mental health issues the kind of low frustration communication difficulties, um, habitual patterns as well. What sort of habitual patterns do we get ourselves into that we don't really ever unpack? And I've had to sort of look at myself and think, how have I made things worse? Even though I'm not blaming myself, how have I made things worse? So I kind of it's an interesting question to ask yourself because we shouldn't be blaming ourselves because we're usually trying to do our best. But at the same time, is there any way that I could have switched things around a little bit and changed the way I interacted? with my sons or use different conflict resolution skills to de-escalate, very important. Uh, always be open to change, I guess. Um, any given case, this is um, O'Hara, a great article, maybe the result of coping deficits in the face of overwhelming distress, a chaotic family system, unbalanced family dynamics, individual psychopathology, or any combination of these elements. So very important, I think, to be broad um, in how we unpack and understand 
what is going on. But one thing for sure, though we're looking at this in webinar too, systems of help are woefully inadequate. So we often have to develop our, our own answers, don't we? In terms of power, we do need to think about um, power. This kind of violence does invert those traditional ideas about who has the power or who has the authority. Um, and those who've actually created programs to deal with them is, in some ways are trying to help the parents become re-empowered uh, because often parents feel disempowered, but somehow take back authority, which is not easy when you're in a constant daily battle. There are inevitable power struggles that come with the teenage years, um, but often it escalates. Um, and usually, or quite commonly, the control and violence has been going on since early childhood. Uh, depends on your child and situation, but it's not just, it's, the point is it's not a one-off. It, it, it's the daily, relentless, maybe weekly uh, struggle that becomes so overwhelming. Here's another definition to, from Coogan. Um, that talks about the abuse of power um, that's trying to dominate parents. I've already given you plenty, so you will have much to think about. We do need the message it's not okay, um, because although parents will suck up a lot more than anybody else would be prepared to do, it's still not okay. We do need to actually, um, certainly, um, you know, at, at any age, we're trying to teach our children that it's not okay to kick, hit, scream, pinch, spit, um, steal, whatever. So um, whilst we might have sympathy to, uh, to understanding why it's occurring, um, we still need to actually say, well, it's, it's not okay. Um, we need to actually, um, you know, talk about the cycle of um, pattern of violence um, that is different for our, our, our kiddos. The child is not equal to the idea of adult perpetrator, perpetrator, which is important too, of course, um, because they're not the same. They don't have the same levels of volition or, um, you know, um, vindictiveness. I mean, it might feel like it sometimes, but they haven't planned it and thought it out in the same way an adult might. Um, I mean, and we could be more sympathetic to some adults too, um, because they probably have unidentified neuro disabilities that are impacting their executive functioning and reasoning and self-control and you know, it may be that we've, um, yeah, so it can be intolerant. Yet at the same time, it's a human rights issue. I mean, women, um, parents should have a right not to be beaten up. <laughs> so that's uh, my human rights pitch. So um, in the kind of latter part of this um, webinar, I'm going to uh, look at the impact on different family members. And we've already seen some of that. And for you, before we have our third session, our third q and I'd like you to ponder you know what is the impact on you i mean sometimes we only think what it is on us i mean i don't know that we do but i've certainly um you know first of all you know the impact on yourself then you think what's the impact on my partner then you think what's the impact on my um children who don't have neurodisabilities or what's the impact on uh, the children with neurodisabilities and what's the you know impact on the person themselves who looks like they're the one that's causing most of the um trouble um and so on what is the impact um, we're going to hear from Lee again, um, and we asked her the question, how does this abuse um, impact you and other members of your family? So hopefully this will work. How does how has this abuse and or violence impacted you, your spouse, and your other family members? To the outside world, I look like I'm coping really well. I look like I'm very high functioning, I dress quite vibrantly, and I appear quite confident. But it, that's all, um, it's all false. Inside, I feel like I'm dying most days. I feel that quite often when my daughter's going to attack me, I have to run to the bathroom to lock myself in and I'm really scared. I'm really, really scared that I'm going to be hurt and when she's bashing the door, I'm scared that she's going to like bash it in and get me and she does sometimes have a weapon on her. Um, I think my mental health has suffered. Well, I don't think I know. My mental health has suffered. My well-being suffered. 
every day when I'm driving to school to collect up, I will cry because I know what's coming. I know that there's going to be an evening of abuse. My husband, um, he's a very patient man, but he's quite miserable now. It's very hard for us to do anything together as a couple or go anywhere. We can't go on holiday because our daughter can't cope with that. Um, I think it's put a serious strain on our relationship and I think we do remarkably well um, considering those, um, those constraints on us. We're migrants, so we have around us, it's just us. My son, um, he was adopted as a baby and he had early trauma, so he struggles sometimes with his resilience. And I think it's hugely impacted watching his parents cope with this. He has said that he, it's been really difficult because he's just watched abuse all his life. He's very resentful and angry towards his sister. I think that's really knocked his confidence growing up in a violent home. And I've, I grieve because I've not been able to give the childhood to my daughter that I would have wanted, but also my son. I feel he's really missed out. So once again, um, thank you, Lee, uh, for sharing your story. Um, again, very profound, um, lifelong impacts, um, and you know not what she, um, as a mother or or Brian as a father, would want um, in terms of their parenting, their loving parenting for their child. Here's a quote from uh, the Bonnick book that I mentioned, uh, which really encapsulates what the impact is he would run through the doors to hit me he would scream he would smash my house up throw things destroy everything i was petrified to the point that i would cry myself to sleep i would sit in my chair shaking uncontrollably at one point i actually wanted to end my own life because of what he was doing to me i felt completely worthless there's nowhere for people like us to go it took me three years to tell people when your child threatens and holds you holds you against the walls it belittles you it's embarrassing um, so profound um, and therefore we can't really run away from this reality and that's why we need to obviously um, do webinars like this and talk to each other and actually bring it into the open uh, by doing so we kind of name it and then we can start to perhaps think of ways to help parents and caregivers better and actually share the load of this distress this distressing kind of violence so parents feel shameful and guilty it doesn't matter how good you are or how knowledgeable you are i mean i myself as an fasd informed advocate and parent, um i've had all of those and i have days where i've been utterly utterly overwhelmed and unable to function so we um it's really important that we understand that actually probably everyone in the household is actually feeling this partners um, other siblings, um, you know, and the person, um, the sibling themselves, if it's just one, um, everyone is feeling um, pretty awful and maybe not sure what to do about it. Um, because almost like everybody's not talking about it in some ways um, or just saying, oh, it's unacceptable, it's not working. So the trauma is there for everyone in the household. Um, and for some, it's obviously going to be worse. I mean, particularly if you, you've, you're targeted as the mother, it may well be worse because you might not be able to. Um, you know, if your partner's working or you're not working, you you might not be able to get out and do something different and actually uh, pretend family life is, 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 is okay. Um, how you, are you going to get help? So your mental health services, Lee said, um, you know, your social life diminished. You can't have um, parties or you don't go to parties or you don't want to go to ordinary events because you're trying to avoid chatting and oh how's the family um and you can't possibly say actually it's miserable i've been called an f in c u n t e about 20 times today whatever it is uh sometimes you can't go on holidays because it's just too much chaos and too much noise and too much too many fights um and you're apologizing for your kids all of the time sometimes when you're going to school and you're going like oh did he hit that child again oh i'm i'm really really sorry um it's not the way we try to bring him up at home but it's things are happening and i mean people have been quite understanding um you know of children if you are able to explain those neuro disabilities but a lot of people are just pretty intolerant and judgmental for some people they have to take a lot of time off work um i mean that could be because of injuries it could be because of uh, as i say depression 
themselves. They might have to take meds as well themselves just to get through the day. Um, that might be helpful, of course, um, particularly if um, you know, you've know you got suicidal thoughts and you can't imagine a way out, it can be quite bleak. Certainly the constant vigilance um, and so forth, um, the caregiver fatigue and burnout, that can be um, profound because it's year after year after year and you might not be able to see a way out. There's issues to do with grief and loss as well um, because you might have had much greater sort of hopes for your children in terms of um, being able to function and live well um, and you're having to reset your expectations, reset what you feel you can achieve um, and the hopes that you can have and that can involve obviously dealing with grief and loss. You might feel betrayed or stabbed in the back um, and certainly parents have said that time and time again that you that it's not just the fear it's just the fact that you've loved and loved these children and yet they still seem to harm you and um, nobody can work out the best way forward to try and address some of that harm podcasts that i um, recommend you seeing or listening to because i think it's a audio podcast um, there's the web link for that it's based on a paper by christine gordon and karen wallace um, and it's talking about um, handling violent and aggressive children. For those of you who wish to follow up um, after this webinar finishes. Some parent advice. Um, we're going to obviously talk more in our second webinar about um, how to help, what professionals can do and what we can help each other with and some programs of interventions. Um, but these are sorts of things um, I've either read about or parents have told me. Um, let parents tell their story. So if you're wanting to reach out to someone, even even today after you've um, heard the webinar, um, let parents tell their story and believe them. Uh, that doesn't mean you're not believing the child. Um, it just means you're acknowledging what's going on for a parent. No shaming or blaming. You know, it's not about judging because parents really judge themselves or caregivers and others who are looking after these kiddos. They judge themselves. A parent who talks about CPV is being extremely brave. Uh, they know it's not normal um, in a sense and they know that most services are actually focused on protecting children. Please don't ignore them um, if they tell you because they're trusting you with something pretty big and it may have taken them three years. Access to specialised services um, and tailor-made training that focuses on parents who are good parents. I mean, most I went to lots of parenting courses, um, but most of it was based on the deficit model. I'm probably, you know, I've, I've got things missing in my toolbox of parenting. Um, how about start with parents who are good parents and they just want to get better, <laughs> you know, um, and that actually parents um, are there because they love their children um, and, and fundamentally <clears throat> have already attuned to their children and doing the right thing. But actually they need possibly um, some helpers um, because what they're dealing with is um, over and above what you would expect parents to have to deal with in the normal course of parenting. So, um, Parents might be having a few glitches, so they're seeking help, but they want to keep their family intact without being abused. So it's that, you know, they don't actually want to break the family up. They want to have an intact family, um, yet at the same time, they can't do it on their own. Services should view themselves as standing alongside families. It's that kind of brokering, scaffolding role. I think it's really important um, to help children and parents have better relationships and all to feel safe in their homes, not just um, you know, the children or not just the parents or siblings. Everyone needs to feel safe. Every member of the family or household needs to be feel, feel safe. Um, and therefore, a concrete plan of action might be relevant in terms of what supports um, need to be in place so that everyone can achieve that goal of feeling safe and okay with each other. Um, parents do truly get uh, viewed up with, uh, sorry, fed up with being viewed as having... Um, However, unintentionally being viewed as bad parents, they, 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 the bad parents without a control kids, that happens too often. The judgment is there and we need to move away from that. So we need to encourage supports towards parents who get it. So that's where sometimes the peer-to-peer -peer support, that's why we're doing this, this series really, um, because I get it, a number of you out there get it. Um, because in that respect, peer support um, groups um, or, or um, you know, people who come alongside might be able to assist, um, whether online or face-to-face. -face. And it may be that you um, are able to develop some of those initiatives um, in, in the upcoming weeks. So we've almost come to an end. I'm just going to sort of recommend um, this resource. It's, um, I've mentioned Judy Selwyn a couple of times. Um, again, it's a, a webinar recent webinar um, hosted by a doctor for life i think they're in canada 
it really unpacks what's going on for adoptive and fostering fam families in terms of parent violence and aggression so um, I'd encourage you to watch that if you wish to before our, our next um, webinar um, basically we've reached the end of this session it seems to have gone rather quickly um, I hope it's been useful if you have any questions um, you can email me you could probably email Sophie at nofasd as well um, feel free to start that process but collect them up so that we can have a great session in our um, live Q&A um, on the 4th of August. Um, I'll speak again with you in a couple of weeks time. Uh, ka kite ano. Keep safe, keep well. All the best. Thank you. Bye. Hi everybody. And thanks to Anita for that amazing webinar. I, I don't know about you all, but I know I certainly found some uh, emotional moments as we're going through. And um, I just want to remind you all that self-care is obviously important. And um, I know many of you will be experts on that because you're living this story that she shared with us today. Um, but also, um, yeah, just keep, keep that in mind as we're going through. We've got to keep ourselves strong to, to take that next step. Um, I would, um, just on the self-care, um, oh, we're going the wrong way. Let's go this way. Just a reminder that us talking to people that we trust, um, seeking support from professionals, and that may be in your workplace or that may be um, people that you interact with, keeping ourselves busy and giving ourselves the opportunity to relax too um, through activities and exercises that we find uh, are helpful for our de-stressing time. And where you can get that time out, um, leaning on people that you can for support is just going to be so crucial for us all. Um, we've got a couple of great webinars on the No FASD website, which you may be familiar with, around care and resilience, which is with Eileen Devine. For anyone who hasn't heard of Eileen Devine before, she has a fabulous Facebook page as well. Um, and the sessions we've got on the website are the Managing the Toll of Caregiver Trauma and Building Resiliency in Families Impacted by FASD, and also the Human Elements of Implementing the Neurobehavioral Approach to Parenting. It's a really great webinar that you can watch. Um, just a reminder of the helplines and support. So we've got our No FASD helpline number there. Um, and also other supports like Beyond Blue, Lifeline and Samaritans, who are actually 24-hour services. The NoFASD helpline is seven days a week. Um, I will encourage you, I only had one question come through during the session, um, which is quite a surprise, and that's absolutely fine. Um, I will encourage you to have a think about those questions, um, and you can email them through to me or through to our admin at nofasd.org.au email address. Um, and uh, we can compile those ready for session three, as Anita said, on the 4th of August. Um, so our second session will be on the 21st of July. Uh, we're very much looking forward to seeing you all then. Um, I will just give a shout out to Kurt Lewis, who is one of the No FASD team, who has seamlessly made sure that this uh, continued to run throughout and uh, recorded and shared Anita's video for us. So thank you, Kurt. Are you there? Yes, yes, I'm here. Thank, thank you, Sophie. Thank you for this wonderful webinar. It's been most educational. Absolutely, it really has. And thanks for all your help with that. And as we close, I'll just leave you with our, our website address, our helpline number, and also our admin email address. Please send those questions through and we'd love to hear from you. Thanks very much, everybody. And uh, we look forward to seeing you on the 21st.